السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, we have today a special guest with us uh, in Alcamda Falcons. His name is Dr. Justin Wilcox, and he works in the genomics department for falconry at the University of New York in Abu Dhabi. Thank you. It's good to be here. How are you doing, Dr. Justin? Doing very great. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, to come over today and to discuss a lot of topics that have to do with the uh, falcons, you know, uh, that has effects on falconry in a genetic level. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here, and uh, you have beautiful birds and a beautiful facility. Dr. Justin, uh, you know, you had invited me previously to come to uh, New York University to give uh, you know, a lecture and a speech about falconry evolution, which I was very thankful for. So, Dr. Justin, we want let's talk about some of the research that you have been conducting at the New York University in Abu Dhabi in regards to falconry genetics or falcon genetics. Yeah. So, so as we know, falcons are really um, miraculous birds. I think uh, they have some of the broadest geographic distributions of any birds, just as a genus or as a group of birds. Um, peregrine falcons have the largest geographic distribution of any bird. Uh, they're really diverse. It's one of the most diverse groups of birds, and they're actually really young. They, they kind of just came into being, and all this diversity is just sort of appearing very recently uh, in sort of the history of the Earth and all that. So um, they're very new. They're very successful. Um, I think they're very cool birds from a strictly biological point of view, but then they're also really cool birds from a cultural point of view. So actually the first artifact we found ever from Neanderthals was made out of an Amur falcon bone. So humans have been, even before Homo sapiens exist, even before like, we existed, we had humans interacting with falcons. And it's one of the first animals that we know humans really interacted with in a cultural way. And they still are a tremendously important cultural aspect here in the Middle East, but globally it's not just in the Middle East, right? So I, I think it's really an exciting topic. I think falcons, or any birds of prey in particular, yeah. has a significant uh, value to all civilizations and to all cultures, spanning from you know North America uh, and, and South America and every continent in the world. An eagle or a falcon as a top predator has yeah. always been a symbol of, what would you say, of power or of... Birds of prey can symbolize power and strength, uh, but also being closer to the heavens. Uh, being sort of above all the worldly concerns, closer to the gods in ancient Egypt, Egypt for example. Uh, but they're also a connection between human and man, right? And like, or sorry, they're also a connection between humans and nature in the form of falconry, right? Uh, where it's a reason to go out in nature, you can't command a falcon, you have to cooperate with it, right? And you would know much more about that than me, but... Uh... It's definitely the relationship between a man and a falcon is very unique and very special. Uh, as, as falconers, we love our birds so much. You know, we don't consider them as pets. We don't keep them as pets. Uh, you know, they're part of our family. We raise them uh, in our homes uh, with us. And it's, it's, it's a very integrated part of our culture, even here in the United Arab Emirates and the, the Arabian Peninsula in, in particular. So in your line of work in, in genetics, what have you found out the differences between peregrine falcons, sakers, and jeers? Well, at this point, I, I guess, going back a little bit, I guess I'd say my research is largely focused on just sort of the differences between falcons and other birds at this point, um, because falcons are very different genetically from other birds. Uh, they've lost a lot of chromosomes. They have the lowest chromosome counts of other birds. Uh, and we don't really know what the impacts of that are on the species and how it evolves. But because of there's so many differences between falcons and other, so many other birds otherwise in terms of geographic distribution, number of species, and everything like that, uh, that's kind of the starting point we've looked at. Um, beyond that point, uh, what's interesting is, yeah, you have a different number of chromosomes between a peregrine and the uh, hierofalco, right? Uh, and... You still, though, they're all very close related. They can all still interbreed, as we know, uh, which means you can still have gene flow between all these different species, of, um, all these different species of falcons. And it actually, um, it creates a really in interesting situation because they have what we call incomplete lineage sorting between um, all these different birds, even the peregrine, which is further away from the other hierofalco. What that means is ancestral genes that were kind of in the ancestor of all of them are still in all the birds. 
So you still sort of, or not just genes, but an, a, ancestral genetic, um, yeah, like sequences and that, like SNPs is what we call them, are, you, you can find them across all these birds um, and they're shared. So what's really fascinating is just how recently all of these birds have diverged from one, every, one another, how not so long ago in the past all of them were the same species and how they're all still evolving to be in different habitats or living in different ways or consuming different prey uh, and everything else. Um, as to the specifics of what genes do this or what genes do that to make them different, that's, those are questions we're looking at right now. Uh, I wouldn't be able to say specifically, you know, these genes make these ones different, these genes make these species different. So I understand from uh, the research that, uh, that you're doing and your findings and what you're looking at, you're very interested in uh, hybrids of falcons. <laughs> so what makes uh, a gear uh, or, uh, or a gear seeker different? So if you have, you know, a gear falcon, how, how would you know that this is a pure gear falcon and how would you say this is a gear shaker falcon? Right, um, and, and there aren't clear answers to those questions at this time. What we can say is that genetically, jeers and shakers are distinct from one another. We can say that, and we can say that genetically, jeers and shakers are very distinct from, say, peregrines. <laughs> um, but are we talking about genotypes or phenotypes right now? We're talking about genotypes, okay. right? Um, uh, in, in terms of genotypes, they're very distinct. But but even in terms of genotypes, uh, that's where it gets it gets actually very difficult and confusing to really distinguish them, because they still share so many of these ancestral sequences, and as we know, they can still interbreed. And even the peregrines and the herophalcos can interbreed, right? Um, because they're actually still very closely related. The comparison I make is to a um, to a human and a Neanderthal. Right, so if you look at a European genetic code, about, uh, I think it's about on average, about 3% of a European genetic code is actually Neanderthal DNA. And if you look across the whole genome, you see about half of it is, any, like half the positions in the genome, you could actually have a Neanderthal gene as a European. It's very similar what we see between like a Saker falcon and a deer falcon. Uh, where across the genome, if you, especially if you look at, say, a couple do, the genomes of a couple dozen saker falcons and a couple dozen <laughs> jeer falcons, and start actually looking for specific places that it's always this in one and always this gene in another one, it's very rare, actually. Like, the vast majority of variation you can still find, at least at, at low levels in either of the species. And yet, phenotypically, they are very different, as we yes. know. Um, well, not very different, but they're different enough, as we know. Um, as we say, they have different breeding times. Uh, they have different prey, though, right? Uh, so, in your experience, most sakers would take a rat if you gave them a rat, right? Uh, but gear falcons, sometimes they'll eat a rat, sometimes they won't, right? Uh, so, you clearly have um, phenotypic, environmental, um, these, you can observe them and, and you can see where there's delineations between species appear, but at the genetic level, that's all still being sorted out. Uh, so it's, uh, so it's d difficult to tell, I mean, uh, the differences because they share a lot of the genetics uh, with so, each other. So to just pick a gene and to just pick a gene and say, there certainly are, but to just pick a gene and say, or, or, or a particular sequence of DNA at some particular point and just say, this is a Saker sequence of DNA and this is a Gier sequence of DNA is, is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. Um, like I said, even in a European, it would be hard to do that with like a European Neanderthal, but we're still only like 3% <laughs> Neanderthal. Yeah. But, okay. but it, it's more than that in the Sakers and Gier. And then you have the fact that people are intentionally hybridizing these things, right? Yeah, so we're talking when you are saying about the number of chromosomes, uh, you said that the uh, gear falcon has around, what, 52? Yeah. And the uh, the peregrine has less than that. Like Don't 50. quote me on it. Actually, I know one of them is 52, one of them is 50, from what I recall, okay. yes. Okay, so uh, there is a difference of chromosome. So when these ma match up, the, the chromosomes, to, to have the offspring, is that the reason the gear peregrine hybrids, the females, do not to, are infertile? So, so where does the infertility come? Does it come so, from the chromosome? Maybe not. Maybe um, the infertility might come from. There's actually a, a, there's 
Biologists like to try and come up with rules, and then there's always exceptions to rules. And there's actually a rule called Haldane's Rule, uh, which states that if you have a sex with two different uh, chromosomes make the sex, and a sex with called the heterogametic sex, and a sex where the, the, to have two of the same sex chromosomes, when you hybridize them, the infertility occurs in the one with the two different chromosomes. So um, where this relates to falcons is they have the ZW system like we were talking about, and mammals have an XY system, right? So a female, um, a female falcon is ZW though, right? Correct. So uh, you, you tend to, when you hybridize birds, including falcons, you get infertility with the ZW. Uh, and it's the females that become infertile. And in the male, uh, sorry, in mammals, when you, it tends to be the males, the XYs, that are infertile. Um, but it's a, it's a, it seems to be a similar principle. Uh, and there are not super clear explanations as to why that is, but it could be an issue of um, sort of dosage compensation. But yeah, anyway, it could be a chromosome, it could be related to the sex chromosomes as well. Dr. Justin, with the available genetics in, in breeding, uh, falcon breeding facilities uh, around, around the globe, so we have a lot of the peregrines, we have uh, many types of deer, seikas, and you know, other falcon species as well. Uh, we have a, a huge diversity of genetics that we can selectively breed uh, right. specific trait in, uh, in falcons. And as you know, falcon breeding has only started in the 70s. Right. That's not, not a very huge time for, for selective breeding to, to create uh, something uh, unique or something that's uh, bred for a specific purpose yet. Uh, so what, what, what do you think about uh, maybe bringing in wild genetics back into, selective, into a selective breeding project? What effects would that have? I think you'd be regressing the selective breeding that's taking place. Uh, we don't actually know at this time what sort of genes and loci have been under selection, uh, but still 50, 70 years in terms of other domestic animals, it's time for something to happen. Uh, if you bring wild birds in, what you're gonna have is uh, introducing wild alleles that are not suitable for captivity, basically, or wild genes that are not suitable for captivity, uh, and adding these into the stock. So if you have the phenotypes you're looking for in captivity now, um, breeding in captivity, which you do, uh, you can selectively breed for those. You don't need to go into wild stocks and pull these out. Perfect. Uh, you know, Dr. Justin, the research you're doing at uh, NYU is, is very interesting, and uh, uh, it's very intriguing as a, as a falconer and also for breeding facilities because Choosing the <laughs> correct genetics for a breeding a project is not an easy matter to know exactly what to keep back, uh, the traits uh, to breed, and then we have to use you know, the research and work that you are doing in the university to make an informed decision in breeding projects for the future. Yeah. So t tell me a little bit about the, 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 the genetics, the selection, and what, what <laughs> the work that, uh, that you're doing? Well, so at this time, actually, um, the bulk of my work has focused on looking at sort of the, what we, I would call the unique, genetic, unique genomic architecture of falcons. Um, so this is a little bit of a step back from the applied nature of falconry, but uh, it's, fa falcons actually have a very peculiar genomic arrangement. It's very different from all the other birds. And so my work is really focused on what makes that different and kind of what makes a falcon different from everything else in genetic level. Uh, moving forward, though, and work we've, we have already begun is looking at really, like I said, the species differences and what's making these species different from one another. But there, there's a whole big question, um, just a broader question that, that needs to be answered about captive falcons versus wild falcons like you raised. What is actually happening? So dogs were domesticated tens of thousands of years ago, cats 10,000 years ago or something. Uh, I think turkeys even were 2,000 years ago. And falcons? A and falcons, it's domestic, it's happening right now as we can see it. We can actually watch falcons being brought into captivity, being brought into breeding facilities now. Um, and so this isn't just about my research. This, this is something just, just to understand 
this whole nature of how domestication works and this whole nature of um, human falcon interactions, which is like you said, they're not pets, they're not, yeah. they're not dogs. They're, it's, it's this whole kind of unique type of relationship. So I think it's really just such a fascinating question to be looking into and seeing uh, what is, you know, and, and it's happening in our lifetimes and genomics provides a solution to understanding what selective pressures we're seeing and how a wild falcon is different than a captive falcon. So what's happening now and what we can do in future. Right. It's, it's very interesting, uh, Dr. Justin. So when do we expect to see some of the, these works being published? So, uh, well, you can expect the paper on um, falcons and the differences between them and other birds and sort of their unique genomic architecture, very basic science soon. Uh, and on some of the other issues, uh, I'm not going to say everything I'm working on right now, but okay. um, on broader questions of just um, falcon genomics, uh, ex expect more papers following that and soon. If, you know, if we have you know, the people that are interested in seeing your work or waiting for, for the publication, where can they go to find out more about your work? Uh, I mean, they can talk to me uh, at, at New York University, a Center for Genomics and Systems Biology. I'm um, happy to discuss my work anytime. I appreciate it, Dr. Justin, for coming yeah. uh, over. It's, it's always a pleasure. And I hope that people have, have taken uh, the important points. I know talking about genetics is uh, uh, not an easy matter, especially for people that are not in the science field, but to understand the, the concept with falconry, falconers and breeders, we are all working together uh, for one thing in particular. We're working towards a sustainable future and the art that we are practicing today, which is the art of falconry.